Hi, today I've got something a bit different to show you. It's called V-Lock. As the name suggests, it's an electronic locking device. I found it interesting and thought it was worth making a video. So let's dive in and check it out. The packaging says, please do not resell. Fair enough, I won't resell you. You have been pretty polite so far after all. The reason why this caught my attention is that a few months ago I visited Italy. All the places we stayed at were kind of like Airbnbs, though not exactly, but they all use this type of electronic locks. These places didn't have any stuff on site, no receptionist or whatever, but they still felt like regular hotels. It was all fully automated which I realized helps cut down on operating costs. They'd send you a passcode to enter and once your stay ended, that code expired so you couldn't get back in. I know this because we accidentally left one of our bags behind and had to call the number they provided to get it sorted out. Anyway, the outer shell and the lock cylinder are made of stainless steel and I've always liked the clean solid look of stainless steel. The way it works is simple, you remove your existing door cylinder and install this one in its place. Instead of a traditional key, you unlock it with your password or your fingerprint. This particular model also comes with Bluetooth functionality, giving you more options. The package also includes a small plastic case with a few RFID tags. So you can unlock the door by simply tapping one of those. And there is a cylinder extender included to adjust the lock's length for different door thicknesses. First, you install the system on your door and set up the admin and user codes or register RFID tags. To unlock the door, you can use one of these methods or the fingerprint reader if you prefer, then the locking mechanism will be released. It seems like it's not responding right now. It might need charging. Let me check if there is a charging port to connect it to a power source. There is a USB-C Type-C connector here. Let's charge it through here. Looks like I should have read this first. It says the USB is for only backup and unlocking, not for charging. Since we can't use it to charge, I guess we'll need to install our own batteries. To install the batteries, we first need to remove the stainless steel casing with an Allen key. After that, it should slide off. I'm guessing we'll need three AAA batteries to get it up running. I installed the batteries, but they are not staying in place without the cap. The stainless steel cap needs to be installed to hold them securely. Alright, I think that sound means we are on the right track. The buttons feel good to press, there is a rubber membrane and I blow a tactile switches underneath. Overall, it doesn't feel cheap at all. I initially thought an unchargeable battery was a poor design choice, but eventually it started to make sense. Considering putting a rechargeable lithium-ion battery into this device would be relatively straightforward. It feels strange, especially with the USB connector. They could have easily made it rechargeable with a lithium-ion battery. Then it started to make sense. If it had a lithium-ion battery, even a standard one, it would still be harder to find in a regular store. But AAA batteries are everywhere. This is important because, for example, if the batteries are died and you can't get into the house, it's easy to grab three AAA batteries from a store to power it. Of course, you can also use the emergency USB port to unlock it, but having readily available batteries makes it more convenient. So choice to use standard replaceable AAA batteries makes sense. Anyway, after that, you need to install a screw to secure the batteries in place. Next, we'll be installing it onto the door and set it up. But I'm really curious about what's inside. And curiosity must be satisfied. Let's take it apart and see what's hidden inside this device. First, let's remove the metal cap and then take out the batteries from the back. Then, let's remove these screws as well. I removed the screws, but the plastic battery holder won't budge. I'll try removing this cover first instead. Now I'm going to remove the plastic piece covering the buttons using this guitar pick like thingy. By the way, I can already see that there are two boards soldered together with headers. But I still can't remove the PCB because it's blocked by this plastic part. I need to find a way to remove the PCB easily without taking out the cylinder. It was a bit tricky to remove the PCB, but I managed by sliding it while gently bending the plastic piece. It worked. The battery connector is attached here, so let's disconnect it and check what's underneath with the microscope. 
The thread cable is connected to the reset pin here. To reset the device, you'll need something like a paper clip. It interrupts the power going to the PCB, disconnecting it from the battery. The metal parts here are quite difficult to remove, which is actually a good sign. If I could take this apart without any lockpicking skills, especially while it's installed on a door, I wouldn't trust the lock at all. The point of this video isn't to show off my lockpicking skills or turn it into a lockpicking challenge, but just to satisfy my curiosity. But I'd really like to see this lock on the lockpicking lawyer's channels to find out if he can pick it out without causing any physical damage to the lock. Here is the PCB, which is what I am most interested in. As I mentioned earlier, it has two boards on top of each other. The bottom one is the main controller board and the top PCB is for the keyboard and the fingerprint sensor. These two PCBs are connected to each other through these header pins. So first I'll disolder the joints here and then we can take a closer look under the microscope. This is the first visible IC on the PCB, which is marked as HY623. I couldn't find a datasheet explaining what it does, but based on its placement, I'm guessing it's a power management chip. There is nothing interesting on this side of the PCB, so let's desolder header pins and see what's on the other side of the PCB. On the other side of the PCB, we have our main microcontroller, WCAHCH592X. WCH is known for their 5 cent microcontrollers, so I'm guessing this one is also very cheap and it has Bluetooth. Their SDK is available for download online, so if you want, you can program it using their own tools. Besides that, there is a voltage regulator and a buzzer and that's it on this side of the PCB. Let's take a look at the PCB that manages the keypad and the fingerprint sensor. Under the membrane, we have tactile switches and LEDs that illuminate it. The next chip is 74HC595, 8-piece shift register used to send signals from the tactile switches to the microcontroller on the other board. By the way, while I was trying to desolder header pins, I accidentally ripped off one of the pads. I'll need to fix that before soldering everything back together. While doing this type of things, you should do your work a little bit patiently and slowly, otherwise this type of accident can happen quite easily. The next chip is C-Core CCM4101. According to the datasheet, it's a security chip that handles the fingerprint data with some level of encryption, making it a bit harder to extract the fingerprint data from the device. Next to it, there is another chip marked BF2080. I couldn't find a full datasheet for it either, but from the bits of the data online, it's likely used to convert the data recognized by the fingerprint sensor and send it to the chip I showed earlier. That's all about these PCBs. Now I need to fix the header pin where I accidentally broke a pad. Okay, I fixed the broken pad by soldering a thin wire directly to the IC, and it should be working now. After checking the continuity with the multimeter, I think we are ready to solder the header pins. I'm now realizing it, the RFID antenna is here, I was just going to forget mentioning it. Just to be on the safe side, I'll use a little bit of super glue to hold the thin wire on the PCB and I'll close it up. That's why you need to be careful when removing or disassembling parts, but I think we'll be okay now. It's time to put everything back together, so I'll do that now. I assembled everything back, so it should work. I haven't installed the stainless steel casing yet, and I will do that after installing this on a door. This is the door for my shed outside. I usually don't lock this door since there is nothing important inside, but it's better than having no lock at all. So first I need to remove the existing cylinder from the door and install the one that I showed you. To remove your existing cylinder, you need your key first. Next we need to remove the screw under the cylinder. Then the whole cylinder should pop off if you pull or push it backwards. Mine wouldn't pop off from the outside so I had to remove the key and install it inside and it was really easy to remove it afterwards. And this is how my existing cylinder looks outside. Now we just need to push the new cylinder into the spot where we removed the old one. And we can adjust the length of the cylinder just by pushing it through. Then we can use an Allen key to tighten it up which will also set the cylinder length. On the other side of the door I will place the door handle and use the same Allen key I will tighten it up as well. To adjust it to exact cylinder length of the cylinder, you can push it from the both sides while tightening it up with the Allen key. And lastly, I am installing the screw that we removed earlier to hold the cylinder in the place. After this, if we can turn the knob and see that the lock is working properly, it means that we did all the steps properly. Now I can install the metal casing onto the lock. And if you turn it from this side, the lock mechanism shouldn't work. 
After that, you can activate the lock with your fingerprint or using one of these RFID cards. Then the locking mechanism will engage and you can lock or unlock your door. By the way, setting an admin passport or adding another user was clearly defined on the manual, so I'm not going to tell it again here. I also got the Wi-Fi box from them, which is another product they sell. It's like a Bluetooth Wi-Fi gateway device. In Italy, they didn't send someone to open the door for us, nor did they gave us RFID tags. Instead, they were opening the door remotely via Wi-Fi, and I think they used the device again exactly like this for that. The device has an Ethernet jack and also an antenna for the Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi connectivity. And on the back of it, it also says 433 MHz is also supported. It's powered by a USB-C cable, so you need to plug it to a power outlet. And for the internet connection, you can use the Ethernet cable like this one. There is also another connector here that manually trigger other doors or devices. On the outside, the device looks like this, but again, I'm really curious about what's inside. Let's crack it open and see what we've got. Okay, removing the antenna was easy and hopefully tearing down this box will be too, since tearing down the locking device was pretty tough. And there are four cushions underneath, so I'm guessing there are four screws as well. Looks like those four screws that was holding the cover on. Now it's off, we can see the PCB inside. And right after opening it, we can see the brain of the Wi-Fi box. It is one of the ESP32 modules which is not really a surprise considering the functionality of the device and the antenna connector is connected to an external antenna we also have the ethernet jack and also the components which helps you to use it and this box like thing is a relay which lets you to control other locks or other devices and i cannot read what that chip is but considering they have connected it to an antenna i'm guessing it's a chip to control the 433 megahertz range let's take a closer look under the microscope for unknown parts as well the brain is esp32 room module 32 ua specifically and which is controlling the bluetooth and also Wi-Fi functionality. They decided to use an external antenna instead of a PCB antenna because the ESP module will be staying inside of the box. That's the main reason. This one was tricky to read even under the microscope because they put something like an epoxy on top of this. The chip is marked as SMSC8720A and it's an Ethernet transceiver. Probably you already guessed it before me. Right after the Ethernet jack, we have our network transformer. Also, we have a few LEDs, which I really like this packaging type, by the way. We have our programming header and also two buttons, which are not really controllable by the user, by the way. I am guessing they are used to program the device, like the reset and flash buttons that we have in our ESP32 modules. On the left side of the ESP32 module, we have another chip. This one is also quite hard to read what that is, because they also put epoxy-like thing on top of it, and also with the nearby components, and also I think they scrapped off the chip as well. For this type of situations, there are a few tricks that you can try, and the first trick that I have is putting some acetone on top of the glue-like thing, and hopefully it will dissolve the glue. And let's see, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And after that, I'm trying to scrap this off with a plastic tool. So hopefully I can remove the top part of the glue from the chip itself and it would let me read the markings on top of it. And usually I continue scrubbing it off with a Q-tip. Let's see if we can read the marking on the chip right now. I will put again a drop of acetone on it and try to see if I can read the marking on it again. And it's barely visible right now. It is from Texas Instruments CC1121. It is sub gigahertz wireless transceiver. And here is the antenna connection. And if we rotate it a little bit, we can see what type of antenna that they are using. The pattern of the antenna is surely interesting, but I don't know what this pattern is called for. If you know, please share it down in the description so we can all learn from it. And I think that's all about this PCB here. I don't think anything else on the other side of the PCB, so I will leave it that here. 
The design is simple and clean, and I like it. Once again, we are seeing an ESP32 used in a commercial product. Every component here has a datasheet available, and there are plenty of Arduino examples online. So if you want, it's totally doable to reverse engineer this and flash your own firmware using Arduino framework. Flashing ESP home on this could be a fun option if you don't want to use their apps. All the components are already supported in ESP home, so it should be pretty straightforward. That's pretty much it for today. I am curious about your opinions about using a smart I personally favor mechanical locks for the home security but I don't think it makes much difference for the outdoor shed where I installed this one anyway don't forget to leave your comments down below and see you next time